What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Realms of Metal. Eddie here, back with you from my happy place, my metal room here in the woods in PA. It's Sunday afternoon, man. I'm still sick. Like, I'm not, like, overly sick, but, you know, I got, like, congestion that's lingering. I can't get rid of it. A little bit of a sore throat still. And I've been loading up on my zinc and all that stuff, and I'm, like, over-the-top sick, but still, like, I can't shake it, so it kind of sucks. But uh, we're still bringing the metal. We're going to do another Q&A today. I got a bunch of questions at uh, the realms of metal at gmail.com and we'll answer some of those. And that's always fun. So uh, what's going on? My Islanders fired their head coach, Lane Lambert. Uh, I think it was kind of overdue. I think he kind of lost the team and they brought in Patrick Wah, the legendary Patrick Wah, four time Stanley Cup winner. He won two with the Canadians and two with the uh, Avalanche. I remember his second one well because that was 1993. They beat the Islanders in the conference finals that year. <clears throat> that was like a Cinderella season for the Islanders that year. They beat Washington in the first round. That was that legendary cheap shot from Dale Hunter on Pierre Turgeon after Turgeon scored that goal. It was basically like a series clinching goal. And uh, Dale Hunter cheap shot. I'll never forget that shit, man. And then they had to go to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh had home ice advantage in the second round and uh, they were facing Lemieux and Yager of all, of all tandems. Right. And I think I was the only one that thought the Islanders could win that series. I remember all the way back when, and the reason I remember it well is because I, I graduated high school that year. So uh, of course the Islanders beat them in seven games. I called it. Everybody thought I was crazy. <clears throat> and then they had to play, uh, the Montreal Canadiens in the conference finals. And I just didn't, <laughs> I wasn't super confident in that series. And that was Patrick Waugh when he was goalie for the Canadians and he, they blanked the Islanders in that series, I think four to one. So just it fizzled out, but Waugh is a fiery guy. I like him. He's going to come in and change shit around. I think he, I think the Islanders are going to be more defensive oriented under him. I mean, he's a, he's a goalie, and he's got Sorokin, who's who's an amazing goalie. So I think I think Sorokin takes faces way too many shots. So I think he's going to start from the back and go forward. I think they're going to be more defensive minded. I know it's not the most exciting way to play hockey, but if it wins games, it wins games, you know. So we'll see what happens moving forward. But I'm excited about that. So we'll see what happens. What I pick up lately, last couple of days. I got this in the mail yesterday from Relapse. I got the first two Cryptic Slaughter uh, full lengths reissued by Relapse. <clears throat> Convicted and Money Talks. You know, a crossover thrash from Santa Monica, California. Uh, these two records are great, man. Just absolutely killer crossover thrash. Uh, Convicted was 1986. Money Talks was 1987. And... Uh, this is really all I ever heard from Cryptic Slaughter back in the day. Like I had these two on cassette and uh, just looking at their stuff. And I see that they changed their name in like 2018 to Low Life. And then they changed it again in 2021 to Manifest Chaos. I'm not too sure what that's all about. But, uh, you know, these records are great, man. If you're not familiar with Clip Cryptic Slaughter, like these two are the way to go. So go on Relapse's website and pick these up. You won't regret it. Really, really good stuff. What else we got? Oh, <clears throat> tenth anniversary Exodus, blood in, blood out. Um, this was the return of uh, Zetro to Exodus, right? This is transparent with gold and black splatter, double vinyl, uh, nuclear blast. Uh, I didn't even open it yet. The one thing that I did notice on here, though, that I'm kind of bummed about is on the Japanese versions of Blood in, Blood out. They had a uh, Veruca's cover called uh, Protest Not Dissect. And I really sh thought they should have included it on this reissue. I mean, it's the 10th anniversary reissue. Includes something extra. And uh, it's not on here. So it's it's kind of a bummer. But uh, it's a good cover. And uh, again, who beats Exodus? Nobody, right? So pick that up. What else we got? Oh, I wanted to share this with you guys because this is like... Kind of a special thing for me. Um, 
I put an order in. I, I I bought a couple things from Vincent Crowley, and I bought a T-shirt and some other stuff. And of course, Joey sends me extra stuff, which he doesn't have to do, but he does it anyway. The guy's a fucking killer fucking guy, man. Right. So <clears throat> this is my copy of Beyond Asheron. This is the one. This is the U.S. version on Hellhammer Records, and it's the numbered. It's there's 250 copies of these made. I got number 111. Special special vinyl for me. Uh, super limited, great band, great record, you know, great guys in the band, you know, so very supportive of our channel here and us of them, like just killer stuff. So on that last order, uh, he actually sent me this. He sent me the Odium Records version of it, which was released in Europe. So it's kind of like the European version of Beyond Asheron. And it's got like a little bit different of a layout. And of course, he signed it for me. If you can see that to Eddie at the Realms of Metal, pretty fucking killer. So, I mean, this is that that that's a special record for me, the limited edition one. But this one signed by him is, you know, way up there in the uh, favorite vinyls that I own now. So thanks to Vincent Crowley for that, man. You rule, brother. Thank you so much. So if you're not familiar, get on that fucking website. It's a Crowley music at hotmail.com. Just send him an email. He'll tell you what he's got and, you know, support underground bands like that. Order the record. <clears throat> His new record is coming out February 23rd. It's called Anthology of Horror. He dropped a single like early in December. Uh, that which lurks below the sea. Super killer. I'm mean, super stoked about that. So, uh, you know, pick that up, pre-order it. Um, it's on Hammerheart Records. You can order it right through their website or on Amazon. It's actually on Amazon, too. You can go on there and order it. So check that out. So let's get to some questions here. Uh, I like these Q&As because it kind of gives me a chance to just shoot the shit with you guys. And you can kind of see what kind of person I am. And it's not like me, you know, going down the lineup of a record and who produced it and who mixed it and who mastered it. Like uh, it, it, these Q and A's kind of give me a chance to like shoot the shit with you and be myself and tell you how I feel about things. And I just, I, I think they're kind of fun. You can send the questions to the realms of metal at gmail.com and uh, I'll answer them as I get them. You know, I just, I compile them. And then once I have, you know, a bunch of them, I'll print them out and, uh, and answer them. So thanks for the questions. The first one here is from, Gustavo dash EW seven Danzig is one of my favorite bands. You said you were listening to a lot of Danzig on another video I watched. What are your, some of your favorite Danzig tracks enjoying the content? Thank you, Gustavo. <clears throat> well, it's been well doc documented here. Danzig three is my favorite Danzig record followed by Danzig two, followed by the first Danzig. So, like, that first side of Danzig 3, How the Gods Kill, I mean, jeez, godless, anything, bodies, How the Gods Kill, Dirty Black Summer, I mean, bam, 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 like, just how great of a side A is that? And then on the uh, Dirty Black Summer single, there was a B-side called uh, When Death Had No Name, super killer, if you've never heard that. I know it was on also, he released it on the Lost Tracks of Danzig, too, that compilation that he had. Uh, super killer song. I mean, When Death Had No Name, I think, is one of the best Danzig songs ever. Danzig 2, of course. So many great tracks on that. Long Way Back From Hell, Tired of Being Alive, Killer Wolf. Super bluesy record, uh, Danzig 2, Lucifuge. I'm the One, uh, Her Black Wings. Devil's Play thing is fucking 10 out of 10. I mean, all those tracks are 10 out of 10, really. Uh, Can't Speak, that's from Danzig 4. Really dig that one a lot. Uh, Going Down to Die, Danzig 4, another really good one. Uh, Am I Demon, Twist of Cain, and of course, Mother from the first Danzig. As far as modern Danzig, I've been listening to a lot of modern Danzig. I have some of the vinyls. I have some of the CDs. I'm getting back into them. Danzig 5 is, you know, one of the records that I talked about that I have a tough time with. And I, I've listened to it a few times now and I, you know, I don't hate it. It's just not my thing. I think Sacrifice is a good track off of that one. But still really kind of not my thing that, you know, industrial Danzig record 
Um, but like of the modern stuff, off of Satan's Child, I would say like Lillen and Thirteen are super good. Off a of Circle of Snakes, A Thousand Devils Reign, really killer. Uh, on a Wicked Night, really good. Death Red Saboeth and uh, Devil on Highway Nine and Last Ride is on Black Raiden, Laden Crown, really killer stuff. So I do like a lot of the modern Danzig, you know, not as much as the old, but. There's still a lot of killer stuff uh, on those later Danzig Rexers. So thanks for that question, man. Here's one from Joe Taurus, J-O-T-O-R-R-E-S, Joe Taurus 83. Happy New Year and congrats on the one-year anniversary of the channel. Thank you. Uh, any New Year's resolutions? No. Maybe listen to more autopsy. I don't think I listen to autopsy enough. I'm going to change that this year. Actually, I listen to an autopsy record a day. So I don't feel like I give autopsy enough love. It's a great band. It's a band that I need to listen to more. And I am, you know, so, uh, you know, Severed Survival, Mental Funeral. I, I, I grabbed those vinyls and a bunch more. And I've been listening to autopsy a lot. I also have all the digital stuff, too, from autopsy, like everything, all the EPs. And uh, that's my resolution. Listen to more autopsy, man. Thanks for the question. So. Here's one from Etheria6200. <clears throat> I wish John Bush was still in Anthrax. Were you a fan of that era of the band? Really? You wish John Bush was still in Anthrax? Like, uh, hey, I love John Bush. He's great. Uh, when he first got into Anthrax... It took me a while to get into the sound of what noise, white noise. I got to be honest with you. I mean, they were just coming off a of persistence of time. What's this amazing record for me? I had just seen that Clash of the Titans show in 91, Megadeth Slayer and Anthrax. Alice in Chains actually opened up that show. And to come off of that, and then they get rid of the singer and they bring in John Bush and they kind of change their style a little bit, you know, like. You know, I wasn't sold at first. I had to listen to The Sound of White Noise a lot to appreciate it for what it was. And I did end up seeing Anthrax a couple times in the John Bush era. I forget what records they were on, but I saw them twice and they fucking killed it both times. Like they were really good. I like the thrash version of Anthrax, the old stuff. I appreciate the John Bush stuff. It has a, there's a lot of great stuff in there, but I, you know, again, I go back to the old stuff for Anthrax for me. Uh, so, no, at first I was not a fan of the John Bush era, but I kind of grew to like it. And, like, speaking of Anthrax, I was looking at their catalog, right? So, the John Bush era started in 93, Sound of White Noise, which I think was a really strong record. Potter's Field, Only, Room for One More, Package Rebellion, High Pro Glow, Invisible, uh, Black Lodge. Really, really killer album. Two years later, we got Stomp, 442 with John Bush. Random Acts of Senses Violence, really good. Fueled and King Size, really good. Uh, in his own, decent, nothing. Drop the ball. Dig it a lot. Um, decent record. Then we had, three years later, Volume 8, The Threat is Real. I really didn't like Volume 8 much at all. I mean, Crush is decent. Catharsis is probably the best song on that record. Inside Out is decent, but the rest of that record just really falls flat for me. And then you've got the last, well, not including The Greater of Two Evils, which is all the re-recorded stuff with John Bush, all the classics re-recorded. You got 90, uh, 2003's We've Come For You All, which I thought was a really strong record. Uh, what Doesn't Die, Superhero, really killer. Refuse to be denied, really good. Safe home, super killer. Any place but here, super killer. Nobody knows anything, really good. Uh, we've come for you all, the title track. So I really thought that we've come for you all was a, a strong as fuck record too from Anthrax. You know, not thrash. You know that kind of, you know, everybody got in the mid '90s where they were going a little bit more commercial. You know, Anthrax took that all the way into the 2000s. And uh, then at two in 2004, he got the greater of two evils. You know, that was the John Bush record where they re-recorded all the, the classic tracks like, you know, Caught in the Mosh and Among the Living, Keep It in the Family, Madhouse. Decent record, but 
and it, don't forget, don't get me wrong. I love John Bush, but you know, to me, the, those are just Joey songs. I don't want to hear anybody singing them except Joey. I just, you know, I grew up on that and it's just the way I feel. And I, and I still love John Bush, you know, so don't get me wrong. But like when it comes to when, when Joey got back in the band, that was when the whole big four thing was coming to fruition and they got rid of John Bruce and they brought back Joey Belladonna, which I thought was great. But I really felt that, you know, Anthrax did that as sort of like a cash grab to jump on the big four bandwagon because let's be honest, like nobody, if that tour, that tour took place, nobody was interested in seeing John Bush with Anthrax singing all the classic tracks. I mean, those classic tracks needed to be sung by Joey. You know it. I know it. They knew it. And I think that's why they brought him back. Just an opinion. You know, you, you let me know if I'm wrong. But the, when it comes to the output of Anthrax um, with Joey back in the band, they did a full length uh, 2011 Warship Music. I thought I thought the first half of that record was really strong. Earth on Hell, Devil You Know, Fight Him Till You Can't, you know, I'm Alive, I thought was really good in the end. But then the second half of that record just falls flat for me. Um, then in 2013, they did the Anthems EP, which was like the Rush cover, Boston, Journey. They did Jailbreak by Thin Lizzy, which I thought was decent, but that EP just fell flat for me. And then in 2016, we got <clears throat> the other full length, For All Kings, and I was excited about that because I remember when I first heard Evil Twin, that was like a thrash track, you know, and that's the Anthrax that I like, the thrash metal version of Anthrax. And uh, I was kind of deceived because when I got that record, to me, that was like the thrashiest track on there. And the rest of the record just wasn't like that for me. Like, I felt it was too melodic. Like, I don't mind melody in my thrash metal, but I just think that was, was over the top, way too melodic for me. I would like less melody and more thrash if you get my drift there. And uh, I mean, there's some decent stuff on Four All Kings, but ultimately that record just kind of falls flat for me. Uh, so, and I think they're working on new stuff. In fact, I know they are, and I think they're going to be putting out a record this year. So I'm excited to see, you know, what it is, but uh, I don't have my whole hopes up too high. I just don't, I just don't love the modern output of Anthrax, like, honestly. So, so thanks for that question Ethereum 6200 here's one from patrick bardo 426 I watch any good horror movies lately absolutely not this weekend but last weekend we watched uh suitable flesh that was the uh new movie it came out like what, october 23 uh october last year barbara crampton is in it heather graham is in it um it's based on the H.P. Lovecraft story, uh, The Thing on the Doorstep. Uh, I thought it was really good. It falls under that whole, you know, Lovecraft, Miskatonic University kind of umbrella, you know, like with movies so like From Beyond and Reanimator, that kind of thing. And uh, it's like Heather Graham is this psychiatrist and she becomes obsessed with one of her patients who she thinks has like this mul multiple personality disorder. But the kid, the, the patient is really just cursed with like this fucking evil where, you know, uh, whoever controls it can switch in and out like personality wise, like this demon, you know, goes into the person and then that person's like soul goes into the other person. So it's kind of like it's hard to follow almost, but I thought it was really well done. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed it. Even my wife enjoyed it, which is a shocker you know because it's almost like a b movie and uh but i thought the acting was really good i thought the story was really good so check out suitable flesh you're gonna you're gonna dig it um we also watched malum I, everybody was throwing me comments that was one of the movies everybody was telling me to check out and i've seen last shift malum was basically a a, a reimagining of last shift you know about the rookie police officer it's a female police officer and she's in an old precinct and there's like the satanic cult doing shit in the background and uh i thought it was decent i actually liked the last shift better than malum but malum was pretty good too so check both of those out you'll dig them both so thanks for that question here's one from erica a 
Erica A293. Congrats on the one year anniversary of the channel. You stated the channel has helped your mental health. How so? <clears throat> well, I said in the video that uh, doing these videos and being on this channel has kind of kept my mind like focused on positive instead of negative. Like I said in the video, you know, we just went through this fucking pandemic and things are in the shit. You know, the world is in the shit. Everything is fucking expensive. And like, it's hard to be positive during all that. Like, I don't know if I'm alone here or not, but uh, I mean, to see the world in the state that it's in right now, it's just, you know, like what a fucking bummer, you know, like you bring kids into this world and, you know, you bring them into this bullshit that, that we got going on right now. So, I mean, I'm hopeful that things will change, but, you know, I think I think things are going to get a lot worse before they get better, to be honest with you. It's an election year. Shit's going to hit the fan this year. I mean, you know, and I know it, you know, we'll see what happens. But uh, as far as mental health goes, I've always kind of struggled with anxiety as I've gotten older. It's gotten worse and worse and worse. And like when I was a kid in my 20s, I, I had no fear at all. Like I, you know, I used to jump off fucking bridges. I was such a daredevil. I had no fear. I used to be able to go on the biggest roller coasters there were, the biggest slides there were. Me and my friends hung out at Action Park all the time. And, and as you get older, like things change. Like I, like I can't do heights anymore. Like I don't know what my fucking problem is. Uh, like I said, anxiety is through the roof. And I don't mind talking about it. You know, I, I don't care. If you guys struggle with anxiety, and anxiety does lead to depression at times. And I've, I go through my spells. So I'm uh, I'll own up to it. I'm not ashamed to admit it. But, you know, luckily I have a good family here at home with people that care. And, uh, you know, they're my rock. You know, I get up every day and I do for them, which kind of keeps me going, you know. So look at it like that. And, uh, like, if you're struggling with it, you know, email me at therealmsmail.com. You're not alone. I'll respond. Uh, you know, so... Yeah, I appreciate that question a lot. And, you know, mental health is a real thing. I just want you to know that you're not alone. And uh, a lot of people go through it. And, you know, like I said, if I can help in any way at all, if I could be a shoulder for you, email me, contact me. I'll, I'll respond right away. You know, it's all good. So thanks for that question. Last one. Uh, this is from Vinyl Fiend 1979. I see you are a big Masters of the Universe fan and collector. What are your favorite characters? Hell yeah. Uh, I've been a Masters of the Universe fan since I was a kid. In the 80s, collecting all the figures. Like, I remember, like, you know, coming home from school every day, and they had, and Masters of the Universe was on TV. Like, used, I don't know if, they, if I remember right, they had, like, two or three episodes in a row after each other. Like, as soon as you got home from school, sit in front of the TV, Masters of the Universe was on, old, those old 80s cartoons. And I've been a fan ever since. Like, it's just one of those things that's never left me. I've always been a Motu fan. And uh, I like the villains. <laughs> being a, being a met, even before I was a metalhead, when I was a little, little kid, I always clung to the villains because the villains were the fucking coolest part about the show. Like, the the Masters weren't any fun. Like, you know, Stratos and Buzz Off and Ram Man, who gives a fuck, right? You know, you wanted to see the villains. You know, you wanted Skeletor, Trapjaw, Beastman. Beastman got a bad rap because, you know, he was like this dumbass oaf that like Skeletor, like just to, you know, just reprimand him all the time and make him feel like he's this big, you know. But Beastman, like, could have been an awesome character if, if they made him out to be really a beast. You know what I mean? Uh, I have a soft spot for Stinkor, the skunk guy. I fucking love that. That. That character, uh, Scare Glow, Super Killer, uh, Web Store, the Spider, Merman, I love, another classic one, Spike or Whiplash. Um, and what was great about Masters of the Universe is you had, you know, the villains, right? And then, like, when the whole Shira thing came about, then you had the Evil Horde, too, which they sold, you know, in the Masters of the Universe collection, the figures. And it was like another group of bad guys who. Didn't like the other group of bad guys. So you had two two groups of bad guys 
and they hated each other, right? That was the evil horde, you know, Hordak and Grizzlor and Mantena and all that, and Modulok and Leech. And then on top of that, later on, we got the Snake Men, who was like another fucking crew of bad guys who didn't like anybody else. So you had like three crews of villains and nobody liked each other. <laughs> So I, th I just thought it was the coolest thing ever, you know, so uh, and I still collect Masters of the Universe stuff to this day. In fact, I have them all lined up on my walls here. All the figures like the uh, all the Motu uh, re-releases that have come out in the last few years. Uh, the Origins line, they call it like I have all that shit all around the room here and I, I love it. I can't get enough. So thanks for that question. And uh, it actually gave me a chance to put Skeletor in one of my thumbnails, which is something I've been looking to do for a while. And in case you didn't know, on Netflix, uh, they had this Masters of the Universe uh, uh, Revelation cartoon. They had, they had like two seasons of it or something like that. But uh, this Thursday, I think the 25th, uh, there's a new show coming on, Masters of the Universe uh, animated. It's called Masters of the Universe uh, Revolution. So maybe I'm in the minority. I like that show the one on netflix a lot of a lot of people didn't like it because they say it was like you know feminist bullshit and you know I, I could see how people would say that but i mean i didn't really view it that way i just viewed it as kind of like another masters of the universe story and uh just like the comics are i have all the comics and to me it was just another story so i i thought it was well done i thought the 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 people who did the voices were good mark hamill you know Luke Skywalker did Skeletor and uh, he's not my favorite version of Skeletor. I got to be honest with you, you know, so uh, he does a decent job, but he ends up sounding like the fucking Joker from you know, the Batman cartoon, which he did. But uh, great voice cast, too. So that's all I got for today. Thanks for hanging with me on a Sunday at the Realms of Metal. Um, thanks for all your support, man. Everybody out there, I really appreciate it. And if you have any more questions, you know, feel free to send them to the realms of metal at gmail.com. You know, I'll answer everybody as I get them and I'll compile these and do shows whenever I have enough questions. So, uh, again, thanks for hanging with me and uh, we'll see you guys again real soon. Uh, have a killer week and uh, we'll probably see you next weekend. We've got a lot of good things in the works here, man. Take care.